Thank you, Marco. It's really nice to be here. Nice to see everyone. Um, I'm going to be focusing on a much tighter time period here than what we just went through. We're going to be looking at new QGIS features specifically for QGIS 322, 324, and 326. This is definitely one of the favorite things for me to talk about. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, as as uh, Marco mentioned, somehow the, the pandemic provided the perfect opportunity for my wife and I to relocate from the U.S. to Denmark. So we are now living in Denmark and learning Danish. Um, it's nice to be close to the, a lot of the core QGIS community again. Um, I have a little shameless plug. This year, uh, I've been very busy writing some books. Uh, QGIS for Hydrological Applications, the second edition with Hans van der Quast and Discover QGIS 3X the second edition, which was just released last week. And um, the most important part about this slide is that this uh, coupon code FOS4G event will get you 40% off all of the books from Locate Press, the eBooks. So including Anita Grazer's book on uh, QGIS design and everything else. So um, make sure you take advantage of that. So I'm going to go through these new features by category. Um, there's going to be quite a few categories. This is indeed going to be a bit of a frenzy. Um, and to be sure, there's many more features that have been introduced in the last year than I have time to cover in 20 minutes. Um, but I'm going to try to hit probably the, some of the more popular ones um, and some of the ones that may be kind of overlooked. And um, Marco mentioned the visual change logs, and that's still the best way in a new release to kind of get a, a, an idea of, of what's coming in that next release. So that's how I prepared this talk, was by pouring through the visual change logs and playing with all the new features. For each one of these slides, I'll have a, a QGIS banner in the upper right that will tell you what version of QGIS this particular feature is um, came out in, what it was released in. So I'm not really going in chronologic order, I'm kind of going in um, kind of parts of the QGIS interface. So um, without further ado, let's get started. So the first category I'm going to talk about is data providers. And at 324, the functionality from the GPS tools plugin was ported into QGIS core. You'll, you'll find this now in a few different places. Um, the data source manager has a GPS tab where you can import GPX files. There's also some algorithms in the processing toolbox that have been ported as part of this move. And there's also, in settings options, a tab to configure the GPS Babel settings. Another nice feature is that now, out of the box, you already had OpenStreetMap. You now have MapZen Global Terrain tiles. So just out of the box, you can always have these two layers um, and then you know, symbolize them as you will, just providing a quick hill shade here and uh, some of the settings around that, blending mode and zooming into for ends where we are. So this is just a nice global DM that you um, always have at your fingertips. Moving into the user interface, uh, there's some really nice ways to select features now. If you have a classified layer, you can right click on one of those classes in the layers panel and you'll see a select features option so you can select the features that are part of that class on the map. And similarly, if you use the Identify Features button now, when you identify a feature and you get the values um, in the panel, you can right click on a value and select features that equal that value in the layer. And uh, so this is another just real handy way. Q just keeps getting more and more user friendly in this way. Another uh, nice data uh, and graphical user interface change is that if you're going to add a CSV file and, and map points, here I'm adding a CSV, the, the preview now will kind of automatically detect the, the field type, but if it guesses wrong, you can override and cast that field type into the correct one. So this is a super handy tool, and uh, I think Boolean type was also added as part of this. So you can make sure that all the fields are cast to the correct data formats, and then go ahead and add your points. Moving into symbology, this is a big section. There was a, a lot, especially in 324, a lot of symbology features added. Um, starting with the style manager, you can now import style databases into a QGIS project. 
And there's also a little slider that was introduced that lets you basically just increase the size or manipulate the size of the style thumbnails. So if you're working, uh, if you need to get a better look at those, it's easy to do. And um, it's now possible to invert raster colors. So in this case, I have just a, a light colored base map and I can just quickly in the layer styling panel, check this invert colors and convert that to a dark colored uh, base map and toggle it back and forth. So this is a, a slide of all the different renderers that we have. There's renders for point, line, polygon, and raster and then the symbol layer types for each one of those. And so um, it's always amazing to me just the sheer number of combinations that you can um, produce in QGIS at this point. And with um, 324, we also got line burst symbols, raster line markers for um, lines, and then at 326, animated markers. So we can take a look at these. The line burst symbol layer type is kind of like a shape burst fill for lines. So here I have some building footprints and I'm going to just use a blue color ramp and increase the stroke width for that. And you kind of get that um, shape burst fill for the line. You can then do things like change the join style to round the corners or use a bevel or um, all those options. And the raster line symbol layer, I'm going to use the example here that Klaas Carlson from Sweden uh, first showed where there's a, a little um, footprints bitmap and I have some hiking trails here. And so I can just pull in this footprints bitmap and then increase the stroke width, which increases the size of the image. And then I have a nice uh, symbol for the hiking trails. And then animated markers. So here I have some data for some, some storm data and so I have some lightning points. So I found an animated GIF for a lightning bolt. And uh, so you can just use any animated GIF now for um, markers for points. And there's a nice little setting here for the frame rate. So you can use that to increase or decrease the speed at which that animation plays. There's an, actually another feature where it's possible to now animate any, symbol, any point symbol in QGIS. I don't have an example of that handy, but Niall Dawson has been busy. Um, and then moving into expressions. So every release of QGIS sees this expression engine growing and it's become one of, I think, one of the secret powers of QGIS. So um, at 322, EXIF, EXIF geotag, 324, um, I'll show examples of scale and wave here in a minute. And then at 326, the between and not between operators have been added. So looking at these, um, here's an example of just one use case of using the scale function with a geometry generator expression where I'm basically using it to create a cartogram. So I'm applying the scale function in this um, expression here to change the size of the municipality based on the population density and create a quick cartogram. So that's, that's really cool. And then the wave function. So the wave function allows you, if you're using a geometry generator, to adjust the values for um, amplitude and, and frequency of the wave, wavelength, and um, come up with very different looks for wavy, curvy lines. So I'm gonna um, just change the values here and you'll see how it changes the symbology of the the wavy line off the coast here. And if that weren't enough, there's now wave randomized, triangular wave, triangular wave randomized, square wave, and square wave randomized. So any kind of wave you could ever possibly want to produce, you can do. Um, moving into labels, um, there's a, a now a, if you're putting a, a label halo around a, a, a label to make it easier to read, one of the units you can use now is percentage. And so this can make the, the halo scale really nicely as you change the font size of the label. So it'll stay relative to the font size. And this is a fantastic feature I'm excited about. At 326, it's now possible to, if, you're, if you have a, 
a line label that is uh, using the curved placement. You can use the edit label tool to slide that label along the line. You'll see a little red dot as you try to remove, position that label along the line and you can put that curved label anywhere you want along the line. Really handy feature. Labeling continues to improve in QGIS. A big feature that was released at 3.2.2 is annotation layers. So these are really designed just as an easy way to mark up a map. And all the annotations are geo-referenced, so they're locked in place once you've drawn them. And it's kind of important to realize that these are not GIS layers. They're saved as part of the project. So there's an annotation layers toolbar. And so here I have a map, and I'm going to add a, a point marker annotation. It comes up with the symbol that I'd most recently used, and you have the full uh, symbology array that, for, for features that you can use with these annotation layers. So this um, one here is adding just text for kite surfing. Um, so if you're thinking, if, if anyone has ever used Esri annotations, this is a little different because you can add text, point, line, or polygon annotations. Um, now I'm gonna add a line just to show you what that might look like, where this kite surfing location is using kind of the, the arrow symbol that comes with the showcase symbols in QGIS, and now digitizing a polygon annotation. So these again aren't GIS layers, but if you need to quickly mark up a map, they're very handy. And you would, so this the first default annotation doesn't show up in the layers panel, but it will show up as an annotation layer in the layer styling panel so that you can go in and adjust that symbology. As I mentioned, they are geo-referenced, so if I have drawn some annotations and I start panning and zooming around the map, they will stay in place. So it's better than adding some text to a layout and then having to pan the map and then all of a sudden your label's not in the correct place if you've done that. If you just put these directly into the map canvas, it's better. There is layer properties for the annotation layer and there's some scale dependent settings that you can configure in there. And of course, these will also show up in a print layout. So if I open up a new print layout here, I will see those same annotations appear in the layout and they'll be fixed in place. Another feature here, so that first annotation layer, if you do it just by default, will be that project level annotation layer. But it's also possible to go to the annotation toolbar and add a new annotation layer. And the, dis the difference is that this new annotation layer will actually show up in the layers panel as a layer. And the, I think this is you know, a more robust way to go because you can then turn that annotation layer off and on like other layers and you can move it up and down in the order of layers in, in QGIS. So I'm just adding a few more um, annotations to this new annotation layer on this map. And so you'll see um, in a second when I'm done drawing these that I'll be able to turn those annotations off and this, this will be a different set of annotations than the first one that were draw, drawn in the default annotation layer. So I can turn them off and on and move them up and down. So that's a big new feature. Um, moving into print layouts, if you go back um, in older QGIS releases, if you wanted to add a drop shadow or effects to text on a layout, you had to use some hacky effects like a HTML or CSS to get the, those effects in the text. You now have complete rendering for text in a print layout that you get with um, labels in the main map canvas. So you can add halos, drop shadows, you can control um, font spacing, word spacing, and uh, the, the case of the text and all of that. Moving into processing, there's now in the georeferencer the ability to georeference vector layers. And importantly, the georeferencer has moved. It's no longer in the raster menu. It's going to be found in the layers menu. So going forward at pass 326, uh, you'll want to note that because you may be wondering where, where it disappeared to. Um, here I'm adding a DXF file, I'm adding a vector layer. And there are, there's a add vector layer and add raster buttons in the georeferencer now. So you can georeference um, either data model. 
Um, it's been possible in models to save a model into the project, basically embed the model into the project. Um, now if you do that, you will see um, a sub-menu on the project menu where you can access that model directly. Three two two also saw a lot of um, additions to mesh data. There's a, now an algorithm for creating new mesh layers. There's a mesh editing toolbar, and select mesh elements by expression. The last section I'm going to cover is going to move into 3D and and point clouds. These are some of the more exciting features I think that have come out in the last year. So um, to start with, if you open up Project Properties in Q just now, you will have a terrain tab. And you can use this to set project level terrain settings. And if you open up a 3D view, it will honor whatever you've set up at this project level. In the 3D viewer itself, a really handy feature is a button that you can now choose to dock or undock the 3D panel. So um, it won't try to snap to all parts of the interface. It can just remain undocked and you can make it full screen. And it's also now possible to sync the 2D and 3D navigation. There's a little menu there that you can choose to um, set some settings for that. And at 326, the navigation panel was updated uh, as a slightly different look, and it now includes a 3D axis that will orient you um, as to where you're looking in the 3D view. And generally, the camera's navigation behavior is going to feel a little more natural, um, similar to other software. And in the category of how did we ever live without this is the uh, 3D Views Manager. So this is a lot like the Print Manager, where you can now go to the View menu and open up um, the 3D View Manager, and it will list the 3D view that you have created. And uh, so, so by default, it's 3D Map 1. And I'm just going to change the name of this in the 3D View Manager, and it will then change up here in the... 3D view once I've changed that. And then I can do things like, in, like I can do in the print manager where I can duplicate that 3D view, um, open, you know, open it, and things like that. So you can um, just manage those better and they'll get saved as part of the project, which they didn't used to do. And if you go back to the view menu, you'll, you'll see those different uh, 3D views listed. One of the most exciting new features that came with this was the elevation profile. So now in layer properties, you'll have an elevation tab, and you can use this to uh, tell QGIS that this represents the elevation surface. And you have some styling options too uh, for how the profile line will appear in the panel when it opens. And so where you're going to find the elevation profile is from the view menu, where you're going to um, see the elevation profile listed now on the view menu, and it'll open up as a panel. And there's an option to capture a curve where you just trace a line to get the profile, or you can use an existing feature. So this is Mount Rainier with the most popular hiking route, and so I can just click on that linear feature and instantly get the elevation profile of that hiking route. This also works for point clouds. So this is a point cloud rendered in RGB of Delft in the Netherlands. And I can open up the elevation profile tool with this. And this time, I'll, instead of using a feature, I'll just capture a curve that I digitize across this point cloud. And it gives a tremendous looking profile with point cloud data where you get to see trees and buildings in this case. And there's a tolerance setting which will expand the swath that is being sampled uh, adjacent to that line, so it won't just be one line of points. And if you do that, you can kind of get an even richer 3D plot. And there's also snapping and, and measurement here. And so if you're using a point cloud, this, um, and you have snapping enabled, the measure tool will actually snap to individual points in the plot, and you can measure distances between trees, heights of buildings, and things like that. And lastly, with point clouds, um, at 324, 2D rendering now respects the Z ordering of points. Support for cloud optimized point clouds at 326. Point cloud filtering at 326. 
there have been improvements to the classified renderer. So if you use the classified renderer on a point cloud now, it will only show the classes that actually exist in the data set. And another nice feature is it will show over on the right hand side the percentage of the data set that is in each class. So you can see which class is the most dominant. And lastly, uh, there's this feature to render point clouds as a surface. So here I have that same Delft on uh, the Netherlands point cloud data rendered in RGB, and you know you get the kind of gaps between the point clouds. If I uh, open up the um, layer panel, I, the styling panel, I can check this option to render as a surface, which uses a kind of a two and a half D triangulation algorithm and it turns the surface into a solid view, which is really nice. So the 3D environment and point cloud support, all of this is just in continuing to grow by leaps and bounds um, with each new release right now. So that is it, and if there's any questions, I can take those.